your attorneys may appear in court on your behalf without you present? Yes, Your Honor. We go over the top three moments from week one of actor Danny Masterson's rape trial. Journalist Tony Ortega comes back on to explain it all. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Week one of actor Danny Masterson's rape trial out in Los Angeles has finished up. The That 70s Show star is facing charges of forcibly raping three women. This allegedly happened between 2001 and 2003 when these women and Masterson were all members of the Church of Scientology. And he faces a lengthy prison sentence if convicted, up to 45 years, perhaps life in prison. And there is a lot that has happened in week one from opening statements to witness testimony. So to break down those top three moments from week one. I'm joined right now by someone who is inside that courtroom, journalist Tony Ortega. And Tony has been following this case. He's been a frequent contributor here on the Sidebar podcast on the Danny Masterson story. Uh, He is the founder of the Underground Bunker, where he writes about Scientology issues. You can find him at TonyOrtega.substack.com. And he is currently outside that courtroom right now. As we always like to see Tony, he's right on the scene. Tony, good to see you once again. Thanks for having me back, Jesse. Yeah, I'm dealing with some sunlight and shadows doing the best I can here. You uh, you've been doing more than the best. I, I, I'll tell you, I know I put you in a tough position to go through the top three moments, but I think I think we have to start with the testimony of Jane Doe one. Right. I, I think that could have been one of the top moments if you care to elaborate on why that might have been. Well, absolutely. I mean, she was describing just a harrowing uh, experience, just really brutal forcible rape and and the details of course are just awful and she broke down numerous times there were times when the judge had to literally like stop everything take a recess uh it was very upsetting for her and i I thought that you know she she came across as credible and 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 it was it was tough for her to, to say certain things but she you know she has these vivid memories uh while at the time she's describing having felt in suspiciously intoxicated after this one drink at his house and she's fighting to stay conscious and, she, and some things are fuzzy but let me tell you she spelled out a really really awful scene for this jury and we want to take a moment right now and thank our good friends at the commercial break comedy podcast have you ever asked yourself these very important questions like why would someone want to date a ghost What's it like to be married to a cat? Should I learn to speak a Martian light language? Or why don't television preachers have larger airplanes? Great questions. Maybe you don't have the time to really think about them, but don't worry. The Commercial Break Comedy Podcast has plenty of time to waste answering those questions and so much more. The Commercial Break is one of Apple's top three improv comedy podcasts, and it's available on all major podcast players. And you can also find it at youtube.com slash the commercial break. Two longtime best friends, Brian and Chrissy, get together each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to discuss life, life, love, the pursuit of absurdity. They talk about sinister ministers, ridiculous MLM companies, alien light wing language, TV dating shows, monster hunters, just the most insane topics and trends from across the country and across the world. The commercial break is available wherever you find your favorite podcast, or you can visit tcbpodcast.com. That's tcbpodcast.com or go to youtube.com slash the commercial break. You know what? The commercial break might not be for everyone, but hey, at least it's free. And that, of course, is that Masterson sexually assaulted her. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, not only sexually assaulted her, she tried to fight him back to no avail. And then afterwards, she tried to report it to Scientology and was completely pressured to remain silent. Correct? Right, that, that he raped her, that she fought back in numerous ways. At one point, she says he pulled a gun out of a drawer next to the bed. Um, and then, yeah, she made her way and then immediately reported it to the Church of Scientology. She was, a, I mean, that's the other thing we're learning is just how much Scientology was in control of these lives and how Scientology tried to convince her not to go to the police. At one point, they finally allowed her permission to sue him, but still don't go to the police. And she really had to defy them. And then the other testimony that was amazing last week is she, she described being pressured by the church to sign an agreement and accept $400,000 from Danny so that she would never talk about this event ever again. It was it was just really something. When she's testifying, and I kind of saw this in the Harvey Weinstein trial when I was in that courtroom watching these victims testify against Weinstein, I was watching the jury intently. What was the jury doing, to the best that you could see, while she was testifying? When, when uh, Deputy DA Mueller 
was leading her through that testimony, the the jury looked really wrapped. I mean, they were paying attention to every word. And I don't want to read too much into this, Jesse, but during cross-examination, uh, Philip Cohen is doing his best. He's got a different style, but I noticed the jurors weren't looking at him. And, I, you know, I, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. They might have just been sort of thinking about it, but um, very different style than, than uh, D.A. Mueller. Let's go into that. So the top two moment, uh, I think, would have to be the defense's cross-examination of Jane Doe one. Right. I mean, what stood out to you there? Well, it was interesting to me because, uh, you know, in the run up to this case, of course, the thing that's brought up the most is how long it's taken to get here, that these allegations are from 2001 to 2003. A new LAPD investigation isn't started until 2016. The women say it's because they fear Scientology. So there's been a lot of talk, you know, and motions and stuff about the Scientology component, the policies and this delay. But, you know, defense attorney Cohen said, no, I'm not even going there. I don't care about the delay. All he cares about is that what she's testifying to now is different than what was in a 2004 LAPD report. And what struck me was he's basically put the entire defense on that one 2004 report. But on redirect, we learned that there's a 2003 report she wrote for the church, which is more consistent with what she's saying today, raising the and, and the whole time the, the prosecution side have been raising questions not about what she said for the 2004 for the LAPD, but what the LAPD wrote down. So I thought it was a little risky on the defense's side to just put everything on that 2004, 2004 report when it's it's come into question. And, and just to clarify, are you suggesting that what the 2004 report said was the words of the LAPD that maybe were mistaken, they had a misinterpretation of what she said, or was it that her story changed maybe because of pressure from Scientology, that that's why we're seeing even the discrepancy between 2004 and 2003? Both, Jesse. That, that, that she's testifying that she held back certain things from the LAPD because she, she was a Scientologist. She worried about um, harming David. She specifically said harming David Miscavige, a leader of the church. So she held things back. But also with a problem. She said at one point the, the detective didn't seem to understand she was speaking English. This is a native English speaker. I mean, there's something very strange about that report. And, you know, and that's not too unusual that, a, that the, you know, the LAPD might not have the most accurate report, but to bank the entire defense on it, I just thought that was an, uh, you know, a risky move for Cohen. And you, you talk about the defense's uh, moves here. I think the top third moment here is also you had mentioned to me that the defense was moving for a mistrial, right, because of all the Scientology related matters that were coming up. Can you talk about that? In the first week, uh, Philip Cohen made two motions for mistrial, both based on the Scientology content. He wants to keep all Scientology content out. I understand that makes sense from a defense perspective, but it's really hard to understand what these women went through without understanding their Scientology background and some of the things the Church of Scientology did. So that, you know, back on October 4th, Judge Omedo made a, a major ruling. It was very lengthy, very well thought out, lots of case law, explaining why she's allowing a limited amount of testimony about Scientology policies. And both sides have kind of fought their way through that now. Uh, Judge Omedo admonished the prosecution for maybe entering too much Scientology too quickly. But since then, she's allowed a certain amount. And, and Cohen just feels that that's really prejudicial to his client. He made a motion for a mistrial, I believe, Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon and Thursday morning, both denied. But that was a big moment in the courtroom. Um, real quick before I, 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 I have to ask you, is anybody from Scientology there? Well, we had a Scientologist witness today. Uh, that was very, well, the entire, you know, Danny Masson is a Scientologist, his whole family are Scientologists there in the courtroom. Um, and we had a witness today uh, who was a friend of Jane Doe One's, um, who testified that he's become more uh, strongly a Scientologist just in the last couple of years. And I reported earlier, he's the son of two of the biggest donors in the Church of Scientology. They're $10 million donors. And he came in today. A uh, fascinating moment because he'd been recorded in 2017, basically corroborating some things Jane Doe One had told him back in 2003. And he was kind of stuck. He, he kind of pushed back at the prosecution as they asked him about what was in that recording. But they, they got through it. 
But then he said something bizarre that last week on Friday or something, a DA investigator had approached him in the hallway and asked him a question. And he suddenly remembers he was on that 2003 Florida trip with Jane Doe 1. You, you mean a, uh, you mean a, a pro, an investigator for the DA's office? No, no, an investigator for Masterson. That, 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 a, that a private eye working for the defense had approached this Scientologist in the hallway either Thursday or Friday, I think Friday afternoon, and it asked him a question which suddenly made him remember for the first time in 18 years that he was on that Florida trip with the rest of them. Now, we had a cousin come on later today, this morning, who said, no way, he wasn't on that trip with us. But it, just a bizarre moment that that this... And then there was some real arguing between the two sides with the jury out of the room. Um, Cohen did not like that the DA had made it sound like it was improper for this private investigator to be approaching a witness in the hallway of the courtroom and cohen's like no that's not improper both sides can do it but i, I described it on twitter as this trial's first pentangeli brother moment if you remember from the godfather oh i do i hope it doesn't end up in a bathtub i mean that's the you know except except seeing except for seeing instead of seeing the brother from italy this witness saw the private investigator from Danny Masterson and suddenly had a revelation. The, the only difference is, according to you, they alerted the court to what happened. Who alerted? The, the, the This witness, right? Or there was, or was or did this not happen? There, I thought it was the witness who alerted the court that they were approached. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, both sides came in this morning to talk about it. I'm not exactly sure when the DA's office learned about it, but I could tell DA, I could tell DA Mueller was not happy about it. He was not. I thought it was the Scientologist who told the DA's office what had happened. It may have been. I I'm just, I'm trying to think how the DA's office learned about it, but DA Mueller was not happy. And then Cohen uh, was telling judge Omedo that it was improper for Mueller to show that he was unhappy with it because the DA's office knew but Mueller may have learned kind – of the, his, his co-counsel said he didn't learn about it till today. Uh, real quick, we have about 30 seconds. How did the judge resolve the issue? Uh, she, she denied another motion for a mistrial from the defense this morning and admonished both sides again about how you know to stick to the subject. And um, you know, I think they you – know, we, we got through two witnesses to this morning already. Things move quickly in her courtroom. Tony Ortega, great reporting as always. We look forward to having you back to tell us more about week two of this trial. You can follow Tony at the Underground Bunker. Uh, that is TonyOrtega.substack.com. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Jesse. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining us here on Sidebar. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. We'll speak to you next time.